सो नमस्ते मलिका थैंक यू सो मच शुक्रिया आने के लिए एंड यू नो आई थॉट वील बिगिन वेर वी यूजली स्टार्ट दीज कॉन्वर्सेशन सेट वॉट वुड बी द वेरी फर्स्ट एंड ऑफ फ्रॉम चाइल्ड हुड experience or awareness of the concept of non violence or uh, or its opposite for some people it's been the opposite i think awareness of how the family the larger family operated uh that there were not even raised voices and that the thing was to sit down and talk about differences and there were many differences because amongst papa's siblings from ridula sarabhai to gira sarabhai at the other end there were huge personality differences but that it was always about talking it over and then saying okay this is my way and the other respecting that and saying this is mine uh that happened in school it happened in the family it happened <laughs> when my mother was teaching students um none of the teachers were allowed to either shout at people or as in bharatanatyam often happens they throw the stick at the dancer at the dance student yeah. so i don't think there was an awareness of violence at all mm. there was the complete absence of even a tone of violence mm, 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 then the fact mm. that in my own home i was the baby of the family we were only four of us yeah. but then i remember as early as maybe three that at the dinner table um when there were decisions to be taken that affected the whole family yeah the mantra was that everybody had to be taken on board and i've given this example earlier of a new car being bought and at that time you only got ambassadors of fiats <clears throat> and uh, i wanted a pink fiat and everybody thought it was a really bad idea you are a person after my own heart my <laughs> favorite color too so i remember several dinner time discussions before i agreed on a black one <laughs> so, so <laughs> and kartikeya my brother and i were always encouraged <laughs> you know the house was full of into quote important people and when i say important interesting people uh so there were nobel prize winners and there were writers and there were famous dancers and musicians and artists and painters and and we were constantly encouraged to engage in conversation we were never told you're too young you won't you ask what you want uh and i remember this very clearly that i must have been 10 and my bedroom balcony overlooked the lawn where this party was going on and i had a test or something so i had opted not to be at that party and from downstairs papa shouting up to the window saying malika what is the capital of so and so country and i had just been doing all the capitals so i knew every single vague country and my shoving my head out and saying it and all the guests sort of clapping you know so it's my childhood is full of memories like that of of mridula ben and mota ben anasuya sarabhai having discussions and anasuya ben whom we called mota ben not necessarily agreeing with mridula ben stand on sheik abdullah and her strategy of how she would get pandit ji to agree to his becoming chief minister of kashmir and there was no acrimony there was disagreements for sure yeah. you But know since you sorry no no go ahead sorry uh, it was always it was always amicable Mm. it was it was never i am right or you are right or you are wrong it was this is my way and if i don't agree with your way i'm going to tell you that this is my way and i don't agree with yours yeah yeah but the feeling that the children had been given the ethical pointers and then they had to live their lives yeah and that you trusted in the ethical pointers that you had given 
Yeah. I interrupted so in, your question. No, no, not at all. I, it was a, just a thought that was racing ahead of me that uh, since there was such a close connection with Gandhi ji, and uh, you know your family is connected. I mean, of course, a generation before your father also um, were connected with Gandhi ji in a sense when his ideas of ahimsa were taking their uh, refined and kind of you know more uh, final shape any any memories that you recall you know of the elders uh, talking about any particular aspect uh, because you know by the time you were growing up already this idea had started to float around that oh non violence is just for saints ordinary people can't do it only gandhi could do it this this idea had already that was that was never a feeling that i grew up with i grew up with the feeling that this was real and it was the only only way of life and you know very often people say you have to be tolerant and i think that's wrong you have to be accepting because the minute you say you have to be tolerant you are already suffering another person or another belief and i don't think that's the way to a more united humanity to tolerate difference you know you can say i don't agree with you but you have to accommodate that person's belief or that person's point of view i mean you you can say that you know i'm sorry but i don't i, I don't like these tenets of this religion or i don't like the fact that i might be forced into doing this this and this but that that person and that person's views have a right to exist Absolutely. you can you can absolutely you can debate yet, with that yeah and yet what do we do in the face of physical uh, brutality uh, you know i think in this conversation it's given that we don't equate ahimsa with absence of physical violence you know okay. uh, actually many years ago in 1996 i in 1993 i was doing a lot of work in england and there were a lot of cases of children violating this is my dog begum one of my five and she likes zoom conversations um there was a lot of children against children violence happening and much of it inadvertently so that for instance a child might have seen a cartoon and decided that uh, you know in cartoons if you shot somebody that person jumped up again and therefore using the father's um, gun to shoot a younger sister and the gulbenkian foundation had done a three year study and it, this is something that bothered me deeply and i thought that in order to understand violence so that you didn't so that you could actually deal with trying to reduce violence in society you had to understand the mind of the violator it was not useful at all to only sympathize with the victim because what you needed to understand is why the violator was driven to that violence so a colleague of mine who i was working with a director in britain and i created a show based on the gulbenkian's research called v for dot 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 meaning v is not for victory v today in our society is for violence and where we were trying to see violence at all scales from the hitler kind of thing that so pervades our society today saying you know we are the superior race and we shall destroy everybody who comes into our place and you know this sort of thing to a mother saying to her child if you don't do your homework the bogey man will take you and we were doing and we were doing a pacifist and we were trying to understand what would a pacifist do if a man came into his house and raped his daughter is it pacifism to not do anything is it non pacifist for him to try and save his daughter by maybe killing the man maybe holding him maybe becoming physical what is it that is pacifist and i think i think given those circumstances one would turn violent because there wasn't time to sit him down and say you know why is rape wrong and why is it wrong to intimidate that's not the situation one is in 
what I do try and do is how do I use my arts and my talking and my writing to try and show those triggers to people so that they become people who don't let themselves get to that trigger. That's the kind of education of nonviolence that I involve myself with. And, and, and this particular performance, we revived it again in 2014, I think. Uh, and uh, the American government had invited me to go and do it in every state, uh, in every city, uh, when we were performing it there. But it is still, I think, an important aspect to look at when one is talking of nonviolence and violence. I'm not saying one condones it. And yeah. one doesn't condone or will never condone the lynch mobs just now that go around burning and killing Muslims and burning and killing women they have just raped. That's another kind of violence I'm talking about. I'm yeah. talking about the kind of violence that you rob somebody or you have a shootout in a bank thing or, or the kind of violence that men inflict on women in their homes every day, whether it is physical or mental or, 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 or emotional. Yeah. You know, those are the kinds of violence in some senses that a lot of people don't even know not to condone. Right. And even the current uh, spate of, uh, you know, bizarre actions that we are seeing in India, uh, that not only a person is lynched, but the person doing the lynching ensures a that video his... Ha! That a video is taken and that then the video is made viral. I think I am personally, I must tell you, at a loss to, you know, wrap my mind around this. Ke bhai, Ho kya raha hai? What is the psyche that is giving rise to this? So would you like to share any of your insights on this since you've looked at the issue so deeply as an artist? I think, you know, modern life and the kind of neo-capitalism, consumerist society that we come in and increasingly the fact that we always have something that is bigger, better, more expensive, and that we aspire to, and that we can't get. So frustration levels are very, very high. They were high in the 90s, they are 100 times higher today. We are also making heroes of people who commit violence. The third is that our justice system is not able to keep up, or our political system is not willing to do anything about this gratuitous violence that goes on. And I think today with unemployment and seeing that so, so, much, so many people have so much more and that they're stamping over everybody and getting it. So it doesn't matter how you get something, what is important is getting it. I think all of these feed into a deep sense of anxiety and insecurity in our people. Uh, and this must be true everywhere, but I can only talk about India because I'm watching it. I'm horrified. I'm trying to understand where this comes from. And I think it's an insecurity where, like in the 2002 Gujarat genocide, you know, Gujarati men have been laughed at always, saying that, you know, you are very good at making money, but where are you men? You're not men. So this, this whole aspect of what manhood is, you know, marad ho ke dikhao. Uh, and, and exemplified by the six packs in the films, in the OTT platforms, in all of this, and, and the size of the chest and all of this, that a lot of rape and a lot of the violence was the Gujarati man's way of showing hum mard hai. With their women egging them on, that was the horror, that their women were egging them on, saying, dikhado sabko ke aap marad ho. This is an insecurity that you are building on. You are feeding an insecurity and that insecurity is growing like a cancer. And you need to prove to the world that this level of manhood that is held up as the one you have to prove yourself again can be done by torturing and violating bodies, buildings. What is bulldozer Raj? Same thing, I can do it and therefore I will. I can rape you, therefore I will. I have the strength of the mob to be able to skin you alive and I will. It's, it's a strange, very perverted psychology. And my problem is that it's going to take another 50 years to reverse once we can stop it. 
more immediately malika you yourself have faced a lot of threats um and uh, i can't even begin to imagine what form and shape some of those have taken uh, and yet here you are so what is your inner source of of strength that gives you this tenacity uh because somebody like you has the resources uh, i don't know to just to get up off. and leave the country one that's one or just you know i don't know uh, go to a mountain hide out or uh, you know live the life of uh, comfortable anonymity uh, so what is the secret of your tenacity i think the privilege that i got as a child and still have disallows me from not being the fighter for justice that i would like to be and the speaker against injustice i also have managed to build for myself my own following if you like uh and i don't i think i think i would fade away if i stopped speaking stop fighting stop stop drawing attention to it i think it is it is the very fiber of what makes me me don't think i don't feel very upset and depressed and and say nothing is changing i do and i have friends and partners and children and 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 close close friends from many different parts of the world who say to me you can't you just can't you you won't live with yourself and so one has to find new strategies everywhere because as we speak the world gets worse humanity becomes inhuman and, and he, that's why no I, no sorry go ahead please no 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 you go you finish your sentence i'm so sorry so that's why i try and not miss a single chance in bringing this up you know i have 250 little girls here and not only little ranging from 7 and going up to 60 year olds who have finally found the courage to pursue the one thing that they wanted to do which is learn how to dance mm -hmm. and i connect everything up with conversations about ethics and life skills without using any of those words so for instance when i'm teaching dance and i say you know do this step i talk of energy and i talk of have they ever felt that they go into a room or they meet somebody and something holds them back and what is that if not energy and yet you also have the opposite where you go somewhere and without any reason uh feel uplifted or feel positive or feel happiness so i connect that energy and then i say you know if you do things or say things that are negative you are actually filling yourself with that negative energy and you know the person that you are doing it to may or may not react but and then i go from there into science and into the production of oxytocin so you know it's it's seven years of coming to darpana and my teachers now do it as well because they have also grown up in darpana and they have also grown up saying fight for your rights no why should why should your teacher say he if it means he and she and i catch them and i catch all manner of people uh and i think somewhere it will make a difference to somebody yeah and if it does then then at least that's one little drop in the ocean that needs to yeah be formed i wonder if also the your some of your source of strength is your familiarity with the mahabharat because that gives us a kind of if not a long arc of history but definitely a long arc of human psychology um and after all uh, it's fundamentally an exploration of this dynamic of the psyche of the psyche uh, of the psyche uh, and, think... and particularly on violence and non-violence so is there anything you would like to share and, and, and power and power oh. and the power of jealousy to destroy um uh, I had a Mahabharat in the Sarabhai family, which went on for much longer than fourteen years, and nearly destroyed the family, and nearly destroyed, certainly destroyed the business empire, uh, and it came out of childhood jealousy. So I 
when people said, oh, the Mahabharata is impossible. And I'd say, you know, I'm living in the 20th year of my Kurukshetra. Uh, and I have been a recipient of the disdain that can develop into such vituperativeness. But yes, uh, I think Peter Brook chose the Mahabharata and uh, chose to do it because like Vyasa, he believed there is no psychological situation that doesn't exist in the Mahabharata from the vilest to the most exalting. And uh, yes, one saw it and one lived it every day and one saw it and lived it in the family and continues to live it in the family. And again, where does jealousy come from? Jealousy also comes from insecurity. Jealousy also comes from a feeling of worthlessness. And so much of violence comes from a feeling of worthlessness. I mean, I've been reading the testimonies of the school shootouts and of the people who do the shootouts in America. And so much of it is no one noticed me. I wanted to be noticed. And we are doing so much wrong in our education and our children's upbringing that I'm not quite sure where one can start. You know, some years ago, you did a, a show called Colors of the Heart, which you called a human rights piece. Uh, would you like to share something of that? I mean, give our viewers some sense of what that was about and how you handled that as a, as a piece of performance? Well, it started very early as a thought. I used to go to Norwich in England. I used to do these circuits in England with all my new shows. And I used to go to Norwich, to East Anglia. And for three or four successful successive years, I saw a woman who looked like a Pathan woman sitting in the front row. And I kept wondering about her. And maybe the third year or the fourth year, she came backstage. And she introduced herself. She said, my name is Samia Malik. I'm a Pakistani British. I've been born, brought up in Britain. And I write songs that will perhaps resonate with you. So I want to give you my CD. And the CD was called Colors of the Heart. I listened to it. and My mind was blown away. She sings in Urdu and English. She writes her own lyrics. And she basically talks of growing up a, a woman, B, a Muslim woman, C, a Pakistani Muslim woman with family in Pakistan, but brought up in Britain as a Britisher. She talks about fear. She talks about the rules that a male society makes. She talks about the ownership that the men have on the woman and her body. She talks about how the woman's body becomes the battleground where scores are settled. And I loved it. And I said, Samia, we have to do something. So funnily enough, the first time we were doing it, she came to India. This was 2004. And the day she arrived was the day that Mr. Modi's government sent out an arrest warrant against me for kabutarbazi, for, for illegal immigration of alleged dancers, taking them and giving them the possibility of disappearing into the Western world. Samia arrived. We, were, we had a 20-day rehearsal period and we were opening the show on the 4th of November. My arrest warrant came out the day before the courts shut for Deepavali. Somebody tipped me off. I hid in the boot of a car, like in my family, in, in Sound of Music, because all the airports and stations already had a lookout for me. And in the boot of a car, I was driven across the border into Rajasthan. The courts were shut for the next 20 days. I had to go into hiding. And that entire first version of that piece was composed in the short phone calls that I could do to my dancers to say, do this, do this, do this, and do this. I arrived back and was granted bail on the 1st of November and we did the show as I think either on the 3rd or the 4th. That was the first version. The latest version in 2019, again with Samia, with some of the old songs and a couple of new songs, was a post-Me Too way of 
trying to understand how men and women could deal with themselves again. Because by that time, I had heard so many male heads of corporate say, you know, we will not be alone in a room with a woman or we will not hire a woman. And, and my, my artistic director, Yadavan Chandran, who directed the show, and I said, this is not the way to go. This is not the way to deal with things. So we were five women plus Samya, and Yadavan pushed each one of them to, 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 to find the worst that had happened to them. And there were breakdowns and there were people crying. Things came out that they had never spoken about. The horror of horror. So we had parents at the first show going to a daughter who was in the show saying, why didn't you say you had been raped? You know, things like that. It was... It was an incredibly cathartic show and we took it across America and we were going to then take it across India and COVID happened. But the point was to say there is no one person to blame and that we have to rebuild society together. But we can only rebuild if this catharsis happens and we are able to speak out what has become a hidden non-memory, but is still affecting every single way that we deal with people. We have erased it, but it still needs to deal with people. And the reactions from the audience, I mean, we had men come and say that, you know, we never realized that some actions of ours were leading to this. I had women in, in the Indian diaspora in the United States coming and said, you know, I was married to an IAS officer and he put a heated iron on my vagina the first day of our marriage. And nobody would believe me. And it took me eight years or 10 years to be able to get a divorce. And now I'm here and I'm rebuilding my life and I've never told this to anybody. And I'm telling it to you because you stripped yourself naked on the stage. You told us your worst... Uh, your worst memories, your worst experiences, and you showed us that one can get out of it, that one can still create a life that has the colors of her heart. And uh, it was a show that we've never been able to do in India because the actresses have moved on, my performers have moved on, and the COVID period uh, didn't do it. But it was, a, it was an extremely difficult show because everybody in the cast went through their traumas again and again and again every night. But it was extremely powerful and um, spoke about so many different kinds of violence that we impose on ourselves as well because we are also self-violent. The, kind of, um, the kind of things that we hold ourselves up to is often self-flagellation. And we are not even aware of it, but we permit society to put us in a mental warp stage where we unleash the demons in ourselves and are unable to bring out the light to quell them and to make peace with ourselves. It's going to be 75 years of Darpana next year, if I'm not mistaken, right? That's right. 1949, That's right. so that means next year. How That's is right. that feeling for you? And because, you know, I've, I'm finding so much writing on um, Darpana. I mean, there's a whole essay by an anthropologist, which is called Political Activism and Dance, the Sarabhais and Nonviolence Through the Arts. I found that. I was fascinated to read it. Um, so I'm just wondering, because it's such a large canvas but when you think of the celebration or the reaffirmations that uh, you know you would want to put out in the public domain as part of 75 years of darpana in what ways are you perhaps visualizing non-violence in that in that uh, you know whole scenario i think in most things we do, even if it's a very classical performance, this basic tenet of 
acceptance and the acceptance of the self to start with because we live with so many masks that we don't even want to find out who is it that I am? Who is it that I wish to be? Who is it that I aspire to be? Because we, 99% of Indians and South Asians live the script of somebody else, their parents' script, their community script, their caste script or whatever. So I think a lot of our work is about accepting the self so that we can accept others. Working on the self so that we don't need to take out our frustration on others in the form of different kinds of violence. Uh, I haven't really had the time to think of how we are going to celebrating all my colleagues and all of us will have to sit and, and do. And I'm not even sure that India will be in a state where there is anything to celebrate. Um, we will continue working. It's also 30 years of Natarani, our, our um, stage and our curating venue. So that's a big thing. We've shown and presented more than 2,000 performances from 50 countries and continue doing that. So it's a double celebration. Well, at the moment, we are preparing two pieces and they're not, um, one is Macbeth. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much more power hungry and, um, and uh, lethal can you get than that? And another piece we are pre preparing is on, it's, it's, it's really on women entrepreneurs and what they do and don't need to do and how much uh, how male do they need to become and what happens to the male meaning all the things of cutthroat and aggressive and all of that uh, and how how do the ones who do find another way find another way wow that is very ambitious in some senses yes we are dealing with I mean Rajini, it's very difficult to live a day to day and not deal with violence, reading the papers, looking at the wire or, or scoop or whoever. You know, one is faced with violence all the time. So in some senses, the need to counter it. And I'm, I'm being very careful in not using war words to, I could have said the need to combat it, but that's a war word. So I'm not... Yeah. So yeah. I'm being very careful about that as well. Yeah, yeah. Gendered as is words. impact. Even impact is a very warlike word, though it's yeah, used yeah. all the time these days. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so go ahead. No, no. So, so yes, these are the two that we we have to produce in November and December. So we are deep into that. And for me, you know, I was talking of V four to you, hmm. being an intrinsically against violence person. My director put me through exercises hmm. of becoming an infant who takes pleasure in tearing the wings of a butterfly. And Rajini, because children do this, children squash something to figure out how it works. Our first gesture is this, children do this all the time, infants do this. So we have to actually learn nonviolence. Violence and protection of the self comes naturally. And I remember the first few rehearsals, I used to go and throw up because I would, he would take me for hours into squashing this butterfly and enjoying it and taking another one and tearing it apart and taking a doll and, and beating it and squashing its head. And, and it used to make me feel so ill to have to play the perpetrator. So that was a very difficult performance for me because I was every perpetrator. From the mother-in-law in dowry deaths who runs her uh, daughter-in-law over because she smells different to, to, to the Hitlerian um, concept, yeah. to, to, to condoned violence in the army, to condoned violence in the police. And the, but it made me feel really ill and it continues to make me feel ill when I do it. Yeah. But, but uh, performance yeah. is a very cathartic and very evocative language to get through prejudice and to get through uh, the walls we build around us just, just as part of our existence. Yeah. You know, I believe in this, I'm not going to brook any discussion sort of thing. Um, yeah. 
with with effective performance, not with agit prop boring stuff, but with effective performance, you can put a little hook so that next time they do think about it, they don't go automatically to the the the, the auto response point that they have been fed since they were children. Yeah, yeah. You know, but the good news is that a lot of research is showing that armies find it quite hard to break down these soldiers, the recruit, the new recruits inhibition to harming others. So in a word, I mean, basically this research is showing that armies have to work very hard to train people to kill. Make them violent. Yeah, to make them violent. Yeah, yeah. That's because wonderful news. There is this there is this dimension and also uh, there is work in anthropology and uh, you know kind of the psychology of the species uh, if you look at it in a long time frame uh, which is now showing that cooperation and compassion have played as big or maybe even greater role in the evolution to what we are today homo oh, sapiens so sapiens than competition and 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 grab and but you, you, you know we were we were always told that in the hunter gatherer times the men went out ho 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 and killed a bison and brought it back and that's how we survived and yet anthropological research shows us that 80 percent of what food people survived on was the little squirrels and the little birds and the little mushrooms that the non ho 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 women exactly. gathered together and that a bison was maybe once every month but that it was the cooperation of the women and the, the, the relative non-violence of catching a bird that in fact was and and it is politically expedient to say that cooperation is weakness <laughs> any of us but that is any a, of us yeah who are women but, yeah and are told that you know another woman will be your greatest enemy mm -hmm. most of us know that it is our women's friend circle that give us the greatest strength and i'm reading a fascinating case study mm -hmm. on something called the ululur society for construction cooperatives and so on it's a, it's something that started a hundred years ago hmm. in kerala in north hmm. kerala it was the time when narayan guru and people were talking about anti-caste anti anti this thing equality in society and so on that a group of six or seven construction workers hmm. decided that they wanted to get together to try and see if getting together couldn't be a more effective way of getting work. And it is an amazing study. It's still going strong. It is the biggest CSR spun spender in Kerala. Wow. And it's still, it is still run by your mason and your kadia and your bricklayer. There is, and they have now started an IT park. They've started training their children to go into other things they are doing. They're, they're, it's a magnificent story. I will send you the name. What is the name uh, of the, the organization? I, I will, I will, you, it's called ULCCS. It's Ullalur Something Construction Cooperative Society. Wonderful. Yeah, amazing. Ex, ex finance minister of Kerala and somebody else have written it. Mm -hmm. But and how they have grown, how that, and that they keep exactly the same values. They don't hire managers. They get people from within them to actually, every decision is still taken by every cooperative member who has an equal vote. And I just got to know about them very recently. I went to this extraordinarily beautiful arts and crafts village just outside of Trivandrum. Mm -hmm. I was there as a guest and I said, I mean, this is amazing. Who runs it? And, and that's when I came to know that while tourism runs it, it mm -hmm. is the money of this society who are committed to promoting crafts and arts and, and the finer things and literature and so on. It's their CSR funds that is funding this. And they have another one in Cori Code as well. Yeah. And you would love to read the book. Let me send you the title. And, and, sure. and if you can't sure. find it, let me know. And that yeah. is working better and better 100 years later with exactly the same ethics. Yeah, yeah. And so these are very powerful examples, I think, because they prove 
that these kinds of creative and constructive activities also can have, you know, longevity. The and they are not thing, of course. Yes, but the interesting thing, Rajini, is that we talk more of mental health and stress today than ever before. And yeah. mental health and stress are direct results of our feeling competitive. Correct. If you are feeling cooperative, we don't get stressed yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. And we and we don't have anxiety issues. That's right. So even from that point of view, we should be looking at alternatives. So you know the veteran Gandhian leader Gigi Parekh, in his Ahimsa conversation, he closes by saying that unless we can free the society from its obsession with being competitive, there is no hope of cultivating nonviolence as a way correct. of life. That's correct. That is a... That's why I said it's the insecurities. And the insecurities go, would go away if there was no competition. And if it, one right. was not constantly being pitched with other people. And then you would have, I mean, ordinary people, everyone would have more space to peacefully ask that fundamental question which you've been talking about. Who am I? Why am I here? You know, what gives me a sense of purpose? Unfortunately, today, most people don't get a chance to ask these questions. No, of course because not. Because of, course of not. the pressure to, you know, just, just staying alive. Yeah, yeah. So in, in our that country, you're just getting the next meal. Yeah. Equal. No, not only that. I mean, in at the level where you don't have to worry about your next meal, it is uh, what is your next success? What is, you know, how, are you, how are you am going I to going to, how, how am I going to make my son's wedding richer and more showy and more crazy than all my friends. <laughs> Chalo, that, you know, even if we say that, that hopefully is a, 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 a relatively marginal phenomenon. The more... No, but but, but that's, very, that's what other people see. Oh. That's what is seen. Yeah. Yeah. No, but what I was referring to is that young people... Uh, very early in life are already thinking, how am I going to get that five-figure salary in my first job? Sure. And then from then, it then it has to become six-figure and seven-figure and, 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 and so on. Um, so uh, I give this example very often when people huh. say, I'm going to buy a new car, I'm going to buy the latest car. You know, there are people who are crazy and always buy a new car. And I say to them, but you have only one bum. Where are you going to place it? How will you place that one bum in five cars? And what a, what a choice you have to make every morning. You have to think, oh, this car or that car or that car. You know, don't we, don't we have better things to think about? <laughs> That's a funny one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in closing, uh, Malika, I, this is a question that I ask a lot of people. What advice or what insight would you share with young people? Because you know, one of the reasons why I do this series is that I'm aware that a lot of young people have these concerns that, you know, all that we've talked about. And they are struggling to be free. And, and they don't know where to turn. Yeah. And, and also, I think for a lot of young people, there's always uh, so much uncertainty about do they have the strength? Do they have the inner resources? you know, to take up this uh, challenge. Uh, so what are some of the things you can share uh, for these young people who would, who know that they are going to be much happier themselves on the path of cooperation and mutuality and, and nonviolence in that sense, uh, but they feel overwhelmed by the circumstances and self-doubt. I think at least for the next 20, 30 years, the pressure and expectations of parents on their children are going to remain. Uh, so there's this whole thing, you know, settle down, get a house, get a car. Do you have enough for your children's education and so on and so forth. So I say to young people, if you can't or don't want to disappoint your parents, let them down, etc., etc. Set yourself a time frame and say, I am going to devote 10 years to doing something that will make me guilt-free 
of what I am giving back to my parents for what they've given me. Mind you, you didn't ask to be born. They wanted you, so you came. But they make you feel guilty for the rest of your life, saying, you know, we've sacrificed all this for you and so on. So spend 10 years or 15 years, say, we are giving this. But keep that, then don't get sucked into the rat race. Say, I am going to be doing this, I'm going to be doing it. And slowly start changing the percentage of which one takes predominance. So you start off maybe with 100% of what your parents expect you to do. And then suppose I want to go into organic farming ultimately, and I want to go into cooperative organic farming, then maybe as a hobby, start developing something on your terrace and then get into a group which talks about this. And you know, so slowly ease out one and see that you do have whatever your parents want. You did get married to the woman they selected or the man they selected. And you do have enough saved away for you then to do something else. You know, what often happens is that we don't put markers in the sense that your parents want you to have a house. You have a house, you have an apartment. The need to have a bigger apartment is because of the rat race. So you can say, tick, got the house. Tick, got the children. Tick, got the admission. Tick, have the savings. Tick, can now go off on my own. It's, it's when you allow yourself to want that second car or want the better house or want the third hall. You know, whatever it is that is making you operate, that you get sucked into something and then suddenly at the age of 60 or 65, you say, what happened? And I have a lot of that. I see a lot of that amongst my colleagues, amongst people who studied in the IIM with me, that they grow up, they don't know their children. Uh, you know, one children runs away, one child runs away with somebody. Uh, the wife or the husband suddenly asks for a divorce because the other spouse has been working all the time, thinking they are fulfilling these fantasies of riches. Uh, and I get a lot of people telling me this. And I'm, I'm just trying to say to young people, it doesn't have to be so. That there are so many more ways and avenues that are open to you. And, yeah, and you can you can actually fulfill those duties that are making you feel guilty if you don't yeah. do them. Yeah. Uh, but put a timer mm -hmm. and, and, and have an aim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think this is beautiful because you're being very real. And, uh, and you yes, know, it's you're, no use yeah. saying that you can walk out of the house and your mother will cry and she will say, I will take poison. No, you know, all this drama that happens. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much and all the best. All the best, Thank Malika. Thank you so much. Thank and, you. You know, for doing all that you do. Yeah.